You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 88. Today I'll be talking to Molly Grunninger. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com. But the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Molly Grunninger. Molly creates gorgeous portrait pieces of figures that look altogether otherworldly either otherworldly or from some future evolved civilization. I I haven't quite decided which. Um, Her work is imbued with a strong sense of fashion and design. I talk with her about her background in design and how she pivoted from a career in commercial design to working as a gallery artist. We also talk about the story behind the figures she paints, and more specifically, the story around the decorative elements that her figures used to communicate that story, and how she evolved to develop the style that she's been working on in the last few years. We also talk about what she's been up to lately, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Molly Grunninger. Molly, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you on. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you. All right. So let's dive into your background a little bit. And, and I know, having read up on you uh, a little, um, that you were born and grew up in Indiana. But, you know, I don't know a whole lot about Indiana other than the perception of it being more rural. But there are like city centers. So like, what was the area like where you grew up? Um, I mean, there's not a ton to know about Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> it, in all fairness, it is a lot of cornfields. So I grew up in southernmost Indiana. So it literally borders the river. Um, the other side is Louisville, Kentucky, just for context. Um, but the name of the town is Jeffersonville. But yeah, it was a pretty typical suburban upbringing, I guess. Like nothing too crazy or exceptional there. Um, <laughs> okay. So, but was there areas of like, I mean, you said suburban, so that doesn't make me think yeah. of like a farm town or anything. It was bigger than that. It's more of... Yeah. Once you get... I mean, there are definitely very rural pockets of Indiana, but um, because it, you know, is right there with Louisville, it, it, it's, it's got a little bit of a city vibe. Um, I mean, you can be there in five minutes, so. Did you spend much time in the city? Uh, occasionally, here and there. It's interesting that like you were in technically Indiana, but it was a suburb of another state's city. <laughs> That's... Yes. So they, they call the area Kentuckiana. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I guess that makes sense. I mean, there's got to be other cases like that where there's a city close enough to the border of the state that there are parts of other states that are like radiating around that city, you know? Right. Exactly. When all that connects you is a bridge, mm, you know? Right. Interesting. And what kind of like work did your parents do at the time? Anything artistic? So, yeah, actually. um, So my mom was an elementary art school teacher, um, which was great growing up. Um, You know, we always had opportunities for creative projects and art supplies around. And uh, she was just super encouraging um, if, if we wanted to draw or paint or, you know, do whatever. I mean, there was always an opportunity. So that was pretty awesome. Um, I mean, it was just, it was a lot of exposure to the arts. Um, we were always going to museums and, uh, 
you know, she always had projects going on too. I mean, she would sew costumes for us, you know, for Halloween and, you know, for birthdays, it would be some like weird butterfly cake or some, some shape. It was never just an ordinary cake. Um, it always had a design to it. So the environment felt very creative. Very cool. And so like, how did you yourself become, I mean, I guess if, if, you know, you had that kind of fostered around you, it would almost be natural for you to embrace that and want to become an artist yourself. But like what sparked your creativity and interest in becoming an artist yourself? Was it something you took to at a really young age? I I mean, I don't ever remember there being a moment where I was like, yeah, this is, there was never like a transition. It was just never not the case (laughs) that I didn't want to do art. You know, it was just always there. Um, I was always drawing. I was always, if I had downtime, that's what I wanted to do. (laughs) So yeah, it was just always a thing from the get go. It was, it was just kind of part of what I did and it was never a question, I guess. A lot of times that, um, you know, I hear that kids especially, I mean, there's a period of time, I think everybody's life where coloring and drawing are natural things. And then Absolutely. you go into other practices or other pursuits. You want to become a doctor or a lawyer and you kind of give that up. Yeah. Um, but did you already have in your mind that, hey, when I become an adult, like I want to be an artist, like was that already your kind of uh, like what you imagined yourself going into at a later date? I mean, I always said I wanted to be an artist, but at that age, I didn't quite know what that meant. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I uh, it was always something that I was always going to keep working towards it. Um, but I, I mean, I never had any knowledge of the fine art world, or, um, you know, and as supportive as my home environment was, I mean, I, I can't say that anyone really came from that side of things from that world, which, you know, it's a little different. It's a different tier. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, I just, you know, it was always something that I was doing. And I think it just kind of naturally led to that place. But it's not like it was any sort of straightforward path. (laughs) You know, they they definitely were uh, trying to point me more in the direction of, you know, you need to have a job, you need to make money. (laughs) Um, Obviously, I I wouldn't expect anything less. I mean, their parents and, you know. And so did they have any reservations about uh, your desire to go to art school? I mean, ultimately you went to Ball State University. um, I did, yeah. So was that something that they like encouraged in you or were they kind of like, hey, you need to actually like do something that is marketable or, you know. (laughs) Right. Um, So yeah, they encouraged me going into the art program um, and So initially my, my major was art education, which obviously my, my mom was very supportive of, (laughs) Right. (laughs) but after getting into that, I I think it was two years, I decided this isn't quite for me and I have the utmost respect for art teachers, but it's, it's a different personality. Uh, It requires a lot of patience uh, for little kids. And, uh, (laughs) (laughs) and I just kind of determined, I just really, really like to make things. Um, and I want to be working with my hands and just doing the art. And so, yeah. And then I made an even dumber decision and decided (laughs) to major in graphic design. So, (laughs) <laughs> is that what is that what visual so i saw that you your focus was visual communication i was going to ask yeah. you is that more on the illustration side or the graphic design side so it's it's just another name for graphic design okay yeah, yeah. so that's ultimately what i graduated in and worked in for a couple of years yeah what motive i mean i guess what uh what was the reasoning for the decision to go into graphic design i mean you, you know there was the motivation for not becoming an art teacher didn't want to, you know, teach other people art. You wanted to make art. Um, but why graphic design as the next step? Gosh, I think it was just, what are the options in the creative field where you can actually make some secure money? Right. And like I said, I, the, the fine art world, I think just seemed so obscure to me. It, 
you know, and I always said, you know, I, I just want to major in painting. Um, but I don't think that really resonated. It just didn't seem feasible at the time. Were there opportunities to explore that side of art at the art school you were at? Like, did you take painting classes? Did you have much exposure to that side? Yeah. Um, and even within the major I was in, I mean, a big part of that is, you know, an array of fine art classes. Um, and I did get to explore quite a bit. Uh, you know, I actually found, I mean, yes, painting, I fell in, you know, oil painting specifically, I fell in love with. Um, but I also took metals, which I fell in love with. So we were exposed to quite a few different mediums, but those were, those were my favorite. I mean, I was, I was one of those where, you know, we got 24 access, 24 hour access to the arts building. So I would be in there late at night, like playing with scrap metal and like, what can I make with this? Um, it was, it was like a playground to me, just the facilities and, you know, access to art supplies and tools and like that part of it was fantastic. That's where I really felt at home. Did it ever make you question like, I mean, your decision to go into graphic design? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's it's a tough one because, I mean, you're so young. I mean, how do you know until you really get into things and you know, you have a preconceived notion about this is what that career path will look like. And then you get into it and you find it's much different. Um, and by then your goals are a little different. So yeah, it's just, it's a process. <laughs> is there anything at, um, you know, that you wish that you had had the opportunity to take? I mean, it sounds like they at least encouraged you to explore other sides of art. So maybe you had all of the opportunities that you wanted, but is there anything that you feel like you missed because you didn't uh, specialize in the fine art side of the art community or the art school, I guess. I mean, it's hard to say cause I, cause I didn't, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know what their program really entailed, you know, once you go beyond sort of the fundamentals, but I imagine there, there would have been some discussion of business and, you know, uh, marketing and all of those sorts of skills, which would have been nice. Uh, you know, I, I've just kind of learned on my own with that side of things. And in all fairness, I'm things have changed quite a bit, you know, with social media since then. So who knows how much of that would have really even been relevant. Yeah. Well, and also like uh, just from having talked to people that did go through fine art programs they don't do a lot of that honestly i mean like how to actually sell your work they don't talk a whole lot about that. <laughs> they should right exactly <laughs> it me they should <laughs> yeah i mean and i've i've I've, uh, I've heard that consistently that there's a gap there and i understand like because like we just like you just mentioned it the landscape changes so much how do you lock down a curriculum that's going to be relevant mm -hmm. you know over time right um, so it's definitely a challenge, but I, I, I have observed that, the, yeah, there is a gap regardless of what program you go into. <laughs> right. But in terms of actual, you know, skills, I actually feel like I still got a lot out of it just with the classes that I did take. I mean, I took full advantage. Um, and, and I feel like once I was introduced to certain techniques and ideas, it was just instantaneous. I mean, I, I grabbed onto that information and really ran with it. So, I mean, I, I do still feel like I got a lot out of it. Awesome. And, and so after graduating, and I know you got your, your BFA in 2011, um, it looks like you stuck around Indiana for a while. And, and I think working initially as uh, an intern at a couple different graphic design jobs uh, before landing, <laughs> yeah. I believe, at a staff gig at Motionware. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. What kind of work were you doing during this time, the graphic design work? Um, so it is a leotard company um, for dancewear, uh, and they do a lot of gymnastics um, and ballet and things like that. So it's it's interesting because... It's not something I've really thought about in a long time, but I actually think there was sort of a a little bit of a spark there because we dealt with a lot of very shiny fabrics and um, I assisted on 
many of the photo shoots. Um, so I, I got to see their process uh, and how they lit metallic things. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I did a lot of catalog work. So I, I was working with a lot of the images and Photoshopping and, um, you know, dealing with lighting and things like that and rhinestones and designs for rhinestones and everything sparkly. So yeah, I can kind of see the connection now, believe it or not. It's, it's a weird one, but I, you know, I'm kind of a goldfish and I, I like shiny things. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, I want to incorporate that somehow. So yeah, I mean, it just, I guess, speaks to how everything is a source of inspiration, um, yeah. whether it's um, conscious or, or subconscious, you know. It's true, yeah. Um, and so, like, you know, was a lot of the design work that you were doing at this time, uh, you said it was catalog work. Is that all, like, layout work, like, in design? Were you in, like, was it all digital, yes. like, doing that? Or was it more like illustrator, you know, um, I, I guess, vector design? We, we did all of it. And I did quite a few um, vector illustrations for them. You know, we did uh, some screen print designs. We had like a streetwear collection and um, we did a lot with print as well. So, you know, we had the digital um, catalogs. We had actual imprint catalogs. So we were using everything, honestly. Yeah, it wasn't a bad gig but I didn't, I didn't want to stay in Indiana. So. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I guess, how do you feel about um, commercial work in general? Like just doing, like solving other people's design challenges as a way to like get out of your own head every once in a while. <laughs> I mean, so at the time it worked for me. I mean, I was, I was young and it was serving its purpose and it was, you know, and I've, I've always, tried to balance. I mean, I'm, I still very much have my nine to five (laughs) even now. So I will say having some sort of stable income, it gives you that peace of mind to be able to go back and really be creative and just not be terrified about, you know, where is my next source of income coming from? And that is nice. It is very, you know, I'm always very strapped for time and trying to balance, you know, working, working on ideas in between other things. And, but, you know, that was the kind, kind of the start of me figuring out that balance at the time. So I would go back and I would paint after I got home, but, you know, I, it was a good separation, I guess, in in terms of the commercial work you know, I was able to kind of remove myself. It was still creative enough, but I didn't feel like it was any sort of personal endeavor the same way that my artwork is, you know, and sometimes it's good to have that just so you're not completely emotionally drained at the end of the day. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Was that balance hard? Like to work a full day and then try to also be creative and and still have that spark in the evenings or whenever you're able to make time to do your painting work? Yes. I mean, and it still is. Uh, (laughs) But I would say more so in terms of just energy. You know, I, I never feel like, I mean, the motivation is always there. And I, and I will say if anything, I mean, when you're, when you're working a job where it's like, I would rather be painting at any time, it's like, I would rather be painting. It definitely gives you a little bit of a kick where you're excited to go home and just, you know, start doing what you really want to do. (laughs) You know, so, I mean, you don't feel burnt out on it or anything like that in a, in a very strange way, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's one of those where the goal for me is to always keep moving in the direction of being able to, tip the balance to where I'm painting more and doing the side stuff less, yeah. you know? Well, and, and you mentioned, um, side stuff. Is it, uh, is what you're doing now? You said you still have kind of a nine to five. Is it more freelance where you're not like on a staff position or what are you doing now for the? So I'm not doing the graphic design thing anymore. You know, it was one of those where I, it got to the point and this is nothing against graphic design, but 
I always just kind of felt like I was trying to manipulate people. Like, <laughs> right. I, know, I know that sounds strange, but it's like, okay, well, I have to, you know, do this with the design to sell more, um, you know, to try it. It felt like I was trying to trick people a little right. bit, yeah. which sounds weird, but it just felt icky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much all of marketing, right? I mean, <laughs> I know I'm not like, and that's the thing. I just, I feel like my brain is wired to be anti-marketing, mm. which is bad for art, obviously. Um, <laughs> Cause I mean, you have to do it, but you know, I just, I like to try to put things out in a very honest way, I guess. Um, I want to show it for what it is, you know, and graphic design isn't all that, but I just, I, I didn't love it. I really didn't. And so now I, uh, uh, my nine to five is more art framing. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I saw that you went into framing. I didn't know if that's what you were still doing. I know that that's what you did for a period. Um, mm-hmm. Like, how did you get into framing? It was kind of just a random one. I mean, I, I got to the point where even with design, it just, it was slightly more stressful, you know, and I just wanted something where, a, I was I was working more with my hands and not sitting all day and working on a computer. And I do. I like to be on my feet. I like to build things. I like to work with physical objects um, and artwork. And, uh, you know, it kind of just, it, it fell into place. And um, I was working for a company in, in LA. I was living there for a bit. And you know, we got a lot of stuff from ThinkSpace as well. And, um, a lot of the artists that I love. So I was getting to look at artwork every day. And, uh, anyways, it's, it's, it is what it is and it's serving its purpose, but (laughs) always a balancing act. Yeah. Well, I mean, having, um, balanced the personal work with your nine to five as both a graphic designer and now a framer, how do you see that the work-life balance between those two either enabling or disabling your ability to, to focus on your art? Like, are you, or is there something about the framing work that allows you more time to be creative or more energy to be creative that the graphic design work didn't allow you to do when you were doing that? Um, I would say it's more passive. So I'm able to honestly just kind of zone out and you know, do the work and not expend a bunch of mental energy, you know, and I, I save that up for when I come home. But I, I will say the benefit of all of this, of all of the juggling, is it has forced me to become far more efficient in my art practice. I mean, I've, I've had to <laughs> implement every efficiency, you know, tactic that I can. I mean, I even freeze my oil paint, (laughs) my (laughs) palette, just so that I don't have to keep mixing paint every time. Um, Hopefully in a dedicated freezer and not like in your like kitchen uh, freezer. (laughs) Yeah, definitely not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. uh, My husband knows don't, don't eat that one there in the the plastic. So (laughs) no, that's an interesting, I mean, just the fact that you know, most a lot of people with one job will think about work life balance, but you're thinking about work, work, creative work, like personal work, yeah, life yeah. balance, <laughs> which is a whole nother challenge, you know. It is, you know, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, it's tough. Um, but it is very motivating because, like I said, the goal is to, you know, keep moving towards hopefully one day doing art full time and slowly shoving out everything else. So do you have like a plan to do that? Like, do you have like a five year, 10 year, like, Hey, I'm going to ease a little bit more into to my fine art and a little bit less into the framing work and kind of uh, gradually over time shift that divide. Um, I mean, slowly cutting out days, um, you know, reducing my, my nine to five work week, uh, little by little, I, which I've done in the past. Um, I recently moved, so it's it's hectic right now because um, I'm in a, a new position in a new state. I'm in Tennessee now. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, I, honestly, I, I feel like for a little while, it's just, you just have to stay hungry and really just work like crazy. Um, and just keep trying to get in shows and keep, you know, marketing yourself. And once you start to get more opportunities, um, you know, that availability of work, I, I think will help me to, to do that. So, yeah. You mentioned, uh, wanted to get out of Indiana for a while Mm -hmm. and move to LA for a bit. What motivated that move to LA? Like what attracted you to the West coast? So this is where, you know, I was never (laughs) super vocal about my artistic goals, but it was always there, um, on the back burner. And, you know, I was, I was an avid reader of juxtapose. And I mean, I knew about the art scene in LA and I just knew that's where I needed to be. Um, if, if I wanted to immerse myself in that, not that I went out there for this reason, but my now husband was also living out there at the time. Uh, <laughs> so it was a motivating factor. But um, yeah, it, when, once I did get there and I was introduced to that art scene, I was doing um, some work for a mural company called Branded Arts. I, I don't know if you've heard of it, yeah. but um, they did a lot of project uh, mural projects around the city and I was scouting um, wall locations for them for some time. Nice. And that's how I got introduced to Andrew at ThinkSpace. Very cool. And, you know, he gave me a shot. I, I was shocked. Um, I, you know, I had some work under my belt at the time. So I had a few things to to show and yeah, I started to do some group shows and they liked it. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I kept showing with them and, and ran with it. And, you know, honestly, because of that, it's, it's allowed me to really grow in that realm. Uh, so that, that was a huge one, but I, I have never felt more at home with a particular art style. Um, the the new contemporary art movement just it feels right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really cool. What, what and what was your experience? In, you know, you mentioned that you're not there anymore, but what was your experience like with the art community in LA? Like, were you able to? Or were you pretty active? Were you going to openings and stuff like that? I was um, here and there, but you know, I would go to a lot of the openings at Think Space, and honestly, every member of that community is amazing. <laughs> I mean, you, you feel right at home from the very beginning, you know, and every artist that I talked to was just such a great conversation and you just connect immediately. It's like, oh yeah, I do that too. And what's your process? And, you know, (laughs) so that was really fun just to be surrounded by that. Um, and to have that availability to just, oh, well, they're having this opening. I'm going to go swing by and look at some amazing art. And truly everything that they display is incredible. So there's, there's no lack of just being dazzled. (laughs) Now that you're in Tennessee, is that something that you're, you're missing a little bit or or do you have other, like, is there uh, another art scene there that, that has become a good replacement? Um, I mean, I'm still exploring it. Listen, and I'm not trying to knock the art scene out here. Um, it's just, it's different. It's, it's, it's not, I I haven't found anything in the new contemporary realm yet. Um, I'm still looking, uh, so there's still a chance of that, but I would say the art scene out here is still growing, but ripe for the picking, perhaps. Uh, there you so go. there's that, <laughs> there's that. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm still showing elsewhere and you know, the great thing nowadays is you don't have to be in the exact location, right. um, in order to show your work and, you know, with the rise of social media, um, it's really changed the game. So yeah, options are still out there. You mentioned the role of social media, I guess, how, how, has it been important to you or how does your relationship with a gallery um, 
contribute? You know, how, how do you feel that it's contribute to your career over the years? Is it necessary still? Do you feel like that's still a, a really important relationship to have versus trying to embrace more of social media? Um, I mean, I think for me, it's been pretty crucial. You know, I'm like I said, that particular community, I mean, the fine art world can be so obscure there's no guidebook and it's a lot of just figuring things out as you go. And the great thing that galleries do is they really help to facilitate that learning and, you know, make those introductions and, um, and it provides a, you know, kind of a bit of a professional outlet where it, it validates your artwork to collectors and the public and you know it's like that little stamp on your artwork like you are you are approved so in that uh facet i think it's pretty crucial um just getting yourself out there and getting established yeah yeah sort of like a set of credentials in in yeah. some other field <laughs> yeah yeah so let's dive into the work itself. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, you have a strong focus on portraiture, um, you know, featuring what appears to me. And, and it's funny you mentioned your interest in metals earlier, but there's a strong like metallic presence in your work um, with gorgeously adorned, you know, heads. It begs the question to me is, who are these people? Is there a story there? Do you have a kind of story in mind behind the figures that you're painting? I mean, to me, they seem very majestic and regal, you know. So, so the figures themselves are not any particular person. Um, I mean, I've, I've used real people here and there in the past, um, you know, friends and family to, to model. But in general, my, my subjects are more placeholders for ideas um, about humans in general. You know, they're just kind of vessels. <laughs> and, and, you know, the ideas are really, they more reflect social issues um, and aspects of the human experience. And the objects, it's sort of creating this sort of human diorama. So the objects themselves, there is very much a story there. You know, I like to include elements that have meaning in my work, whether it resonates or not. I mean, I, for me, it makes it more interesting. But yeah, I mean, every everything seeks to tell some aspect of the human experience, whether it be emotional, um, you know, or about the environment, um, just whatever I, I feel people would connect to mm. on some sort of emotional level. And that was, that was another kind of thing I was curious about is are the, the things that your work speaks about more personal, like your reflecting on aspects of your own or, you know, imbuing them with aspects of your own personality and story? Or is it more of a general statement about the state of humanity and kind of commentary on, on humans and the pursuit of whatever we pursue? <laughs> right. I mean, a bit of both, you know, obviously everything, you know, is filtered through my own experience. Sure. So, you know, my, my sources of inspiration are, are going to be my own. I think looking back at some of the work, there are definitely more personal aspects subconsciously that were thrown in there. You know, I would say it's more about bigger issues than just myself though. You know, I want to, I want to connect to people on a, on a broader spectrum, you know, so I don't want it to just be about me, but initially, you know, when I, when I started this idea, if you will, the theme revolved very much around socialization and, you know, you are adorned with this and you are trying to communicate to someone else through these objects. So it's sort of this representational quality, you know, kind of like a bird of paradise Oh, nice. where, yeah, it's, it's just that, that very immediate visual display of communication you know and that's where i was using a lot of very shiny metallic objects and ribbons and um 
that was very much meaning behind that, but it has definitely evolved over the years. And I wanted to start incorporating more of the outside world in with the subjects. And nowadays I, I'm trying to have more of an interplay between, you know, the outside environment and the subject at hand and just kind of showing how humans in general, you know, sort of shape the outside world and the outside world, you know, shapes them in a way and they become intertwined and tangled into one new creature, if you will. (laughs) (laughs) That's fascinating. Um, you know, having looked through your your portfolio, you definitely see these stages of evolution. Um, I think your earliest work, you still had a lot of adornment, but it was f- more full figure poses. You had backgrounds. It was, and then you started to zoom in more, drop the background yeah. a lot. Um, and then now, like you said, you focused more on evolving the person to beyond just a person wearing something to a person like being something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So it's, exactly. It's interesting. Uh, and, and, but what you said really resonated with me about the bird of paradise and like adornment as a form of like identity and, and communicating one's inner self through their outer appearance. Um, I guess, yes. how did you land? Like, what, what motivated that motif? Because even in your earliest work, you were using a lot of ribbons, a lot of, um, you know, uh, dressing to communicate, uh, a person's inner being. So how did that become such a big focus or like presence in your, in your art? Um, I mean, I just think I've always been fascinated by the social aspects of, of people. I, you know, and just the kind of the displays that we put on. And I, and I think also with, you know, me growing up in a time of, you know, social media, you see a lot of this nowadays where it's, it's this facade that can be put on as a way to say, you know, this is me, this is who I am. And it, it is hard nowadays to really get past that and say, okay, well, I just want to figure out who this person is. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper uh, and, go beyond the shell and the objects and the dazzle. Um, So it's just, it's a subject that's always fascinated me and just how people interact with the world around them and interpret it. Yeah, that is so true, especially Instagram. It's, it's such a, like the perfect photo of a meal or a perfect, like everybody is curating the photos that are everybody in the world is seeing and making it just pixel perfect. Nobody's life is really like that. (laughs) No, no. I want to see the grit. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Right. And so getting kind of speaking to that and, and a desire to get back to a more authentic place, I think is, is pretty powerful message. Um, How do you approach, like from a process perspective, how do you arrive at ideas for new pieces? Do you have any kind of like brainstorming activities or, uh, you know, daily sketch routines, stuff like that? I'll usually have something in my mind. Um, And I mean, I take little bits of inspiration everywhere I go. It could be, you know, a, a color scheme that I see when I'm just out and about or a particular mood that I'm trying to convey. And I mean, I definitely take a lot of notes, a lot of brainstorming notes. And anytime something pops in my head, I jot it down. But I do have forced (laughs) sessions where I just, I'll go for a run and I brainstorm. And I just, I, I have this stupid game that I'll do with myself where I just try not to control my thoughts. And I just, whatever is running through my head, I'm like, I'm just going to let it go. (laughs) <laughs> and see what it comes up with. I'm gonna see what it generates. I'm just gonna if if I if I see an interesting one, I'm gonna pluck it out. <laughs> what do you do with those? Do you, are you you're like writing words down, or are you drawing things? No, or? it's just whatever whatever visuals come into my mind um, as a way to say, okay, that's an interesting composition. And you know, I I have to kind of see it in my head first, and then from there I'll go and I'll do some sketches. And, you know, play with different compositions and things like that. But once I kind of have a a good idea of where I want to go with something, then I usually start 
building and I like to build um, generally mock-ups of the scenes that I want to portray. And I mean, I use a variety of materials like clay and paper and um, just whatever I think would convey it the best. Um, and I, I have a bunch of mannequins that now I use kind of as placeholders, you know, which I will eventually swap out a, a realistic face and sort of do like this Frankensteining of, you know, cause I want to bring more realistic features in nowadays. Um, you know, I just, there's so many cool faces out there and I'm, <laughs> 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 I want to, I want to play with all of those features. So you know, it's a lot of different techniques. I mean, I'll, I'll go back and forth mm. between, you know, creating my reference, photographing my reference, um, adding in other drawn details. And, you know, sometimes I, I use myself as the placeholder. Uh, <laughs> and so how does that, work? I mean, how does that, so you said building, um, yeah, yeah. does that mean that everything that you paint, you generally have some amount of physical representation that you've created also? Usually, usually, at least to an extent. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said, other other details uh, I can add in, you know, depending on how much I want to physically create, Uh, you know, and sometimes I'll composite other elements digitally. But it's it's very much a combination of many, many different things. But I do like to sort of figure out my composition ahead of time, you know, so that when I get to the painting stage, I can very much focus on painting. And so is that a combination of the physical and digital? Like you said, um, you'll sometimes swap in faces, like real faces, so that mm-hmm. you get more realistic images. Is that like digital compositions that you're uh, using yeah. collage to yeah. do? Yeah, so everything is mocked up digitally. So even okay. um, the the physical elements, like I said, I'll photograph them, and then they will be, you know, put into. I just use like Photoshop to to mock up everything, you know, and then I can add other elements. Uh, sometimes I print things off and draw other details oh, wow. in, um, and even once I have my my composition figured out, and you know. I, I like to play with colors a lot and and different um, contrasts. So it allows me that freedom to really play with how I want everything to to be rendered. But once all of that is figured out, then I'll usually do a drawing of it, which I know seems a little backwards, but it allows me to refine certain elements as well and add other things in. So I can get my good line drawing. So yeah, it's it is a multi-step process. Yeah. But I, I always like to have a digital reference because when it comes to the actual painting side, it's it's good for rendering. Um, and like I said, I can play with the different aspects of it, you know, before I really commit. Yeah. How do you approach lighting if there's multiple things participating in that digital, you know, digital collage? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, some things it's, it's figuring it out as I go. Um, and so that's why I like to build things up to a certain extent so I can get those main lighting sources, the very important ones, my main shadows and highlights and things like that. And it serves a bit as a guide. If I'm going to include other elements, either digitally or drawn, I, I, I have a guide to be able to figure out, you know, where am I going to put the shadow? Where am I going to put this light source? And usually I can, I can figure it out enough at that point to where it works, you know, whether it's accurate or not, (laughs) it's, it's enough to be visually convincing. So, yeah. Between the digital comp and then what you've done later as a a line drawing um, to kind of refine things, by the time you actually start painting, is everything pretty locked down at that point? Or do you like, do you already know how the piece is for the most part going to turn out? Or is there still some amount of evolution that you allow yourself while you're painting? So usually things are pretty locked down. But having said that, I mean, there are times that I'll decide to add in some other element, um, you know, or if I'm something just isn't working or I want to change a color or something like that. I mean, I still 
do change things up on occasion. You know, as long as the bulk of it is is locked down, it's it's fairly easy to add other details and um yeah, tweak it a bit. So Okay. And and once you start and then maybe this uh, is also informed by what we were talking about earlier with the efficiency that you've approached your practice with because of necessity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But once you start working on a piece, do you normally focus on that one piece entirely? Um, or do you like to work on multiple pieces at once just either for efficiency reasons or just to change things up and have some, you know, variety? <laughs> I do kind of like to focus on one piece at a time. Um, when I When I was getting things ready for my, my solo show, I would get the painting to a certain point, um, to where I felt I could live with it. (laughs) You know, even if there were a few things I ideally wanted to, you know, to improve down the road, I would put that off to the side and then start the next one. So it was more just getting it to a point, but in general, yeah, I, it'll drive me crazy if I, it'll just weigh on my mind for some reason. It's this vendetta, but (laughs) in order to feel emotionally satisfied and not freaked out, you know, I like to get it to a certain point. (laughs) No, that makes sense. Um, You know, we mentioned earlier that you fell in love. And I think this was when we were talking about your, um, your time at art school, but you said you fell in love with oil and that's pretty much been your, your primary medium for the fine art side of your career. What is it that you like about working in oil opposed to other mediums like acrylic or gouache? I would say it's, it's just very easy to manipulate. I I know that might not be everyone's (laughs) opinion on it, but when I paint, I mean, I really like to move things around and, you know, Obviously, I, I really like smooth gradients and blending, and it gives me the ability to do that. So, and and I like the predictability of the color. Acrylic can be very frustrating in that realm. Um, you know, it it dries a, a much different shade than when you put it down. So, but yeah, I I really just like to blend, and I like the the textural qualities of oil paint. And the ability to, I mean, it's very versatile. You can do so many things with it. You can glaze, you can scumble, you you know, it's, the possibilities are endless. So, and I like to work in layers, so. Are there other mediums that you've uh, wanted to explore or want to explore someday that you maybe haven't had the opportunity to? Um, I, I mean, I definitely have things on my mind. Um, I've always loved sculpture as well. I would love to be able to create more sculptural works, you know, to accompany the paintings. Uh, but I will say my my process kind of satisfies that a little bit for me yeah. in a way. Uh, um, you know, it gives me the ability to play with different materials and just problem solve and and be creative, you know, try different materials and just, you know, see what that's all about. But yeah, for now it kind of scratches that itch, but I would love to be able to do something more sculptural in the future. Nice. Very cool. So, you know, shifting gears a little bit, I wanted, and before we kind of dive into what you've been working on lately, I wanted to to chat a, a little bit about the last solo show that you did, um, debuting, I think it was last October at Ryan Joseph Gallery in, in Denver. Uh, the show mm-hmm. was titled Utopia. And you know, one of the things that really stood out to me is something that we were talking about earlier where, you know, there was this notable shift from people wearing fancy adornments to people like having evolved to being those things. (laughs) Like it's part of their, you know, there was one with cactus and like um, a lot of nature uh, elements uh, kind of introduced, you know, uh, coming into play. Um, So like, I guess what motivated that shift? Because, you know, we earlier were talking about the, um, I mean, I guess it's it's an evolution of that idea of the facade and and like people, um, you know, kind of presenting one thing and and it's being a little bit of a false front. But how did the shift into f- like our impact on nature and how nature has also impacted us? How did that start to come into play? I mean, going along with what I was saying earlier about it, sort of shifting towards 
more of an interplay between the external and the internal. What I was looking to represent was more of a collective anxiety, if you will, in regards to just, I mean, it's it's inescapable now. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of fear around what's happening to the to the world and and uncertainty around where is this going? What is the future going to look like? Um, and I wanted to sort of represent that sort of duality between uncertainty and hope, you know, and I, I, I wanted it to be more of a thing of, you know, we're, we are in this moment. We don't know what's going to happen. And so we're, we're very much still writing the story and I, and I wanted it to be a bit of a snapshot of that, of, you know, kind of those little glimmers of hope, um, you know, human ingenuity and, and just the collective fear of it, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I hope it kind of represents that. I don't know, but. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, it's good to have that kind of hope. It's hard, but it's good. It is hard. It is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cuz I mean, yeah, to your point. I mean, I was just reading I saw an article this morning actually about how this was like the warmest winter in a long time and how that's not yeah. necessarily a good thing. Um I mean, I grew up in a warm climate having lived all my life in in Texas, so like I'm good with warm weather, but like also I recognize that it's not a good thing for like the, the state of the world. <laughs> so. Right, right. Yeah, and when when um I left California. I mean, that's when they were having a lot of the wildfires out there and uh, it was so crazy. Just the, the sky was filled with smoke. I remember there was one day the sun was just hot pink and it just felt so surreal, you know, and you do kind of start to take more of an existential look at, you know, the the world that you're living in and it's crazy. It's a crazy time to be alive. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's not not trending in a good direction. I was, um, you know, again, like my my family. I'm, I've talked about this on the show before. My family's kind of spread across Texas, and my sister and, and her family lives in the Houston area. And like I've seen reports that Houston as a thing will be underwater in like thirty years. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so like that's pretty substantial. Um, and like how right. to even navigate that um and and the fact that and i don't mean to turn this into a political conversation but the fact that like the people that are in power aren't doing anything to make it better uh because of money uh is is, right anyway i'm sorry (laughs) it's no i mean it's it's a lot and and i guess that's with with this series i mean i was trying to convey more or less that it's a lot it's heavy it's hard to fathom a lot of this stuff, you know, it, it seems so beyond, you know, what we're able to think about. <laughs> uh, and when you're, when you're usually approaching a show like this, do you typically define that kind of theme for the show up front? Uh, or do you just start working and then kind of reflect back on what the work became and observed what, like where it naturally went? So I actually did, um, for this kind of define where I wanted to go with it up front. I mean, I took a bit of time before I even started any painting to really figure out what I wanted my themes to be, you know, and, and obviously I didn't have each individual piece figured out at that point, but I knew that this was the direction that I wanted to go. Um, and that I wanted everything to, you know, circle around that. Of of all the pieces in that show, does one in particular stand out to you as like the most challenging for, I mean, considering how multifaceted your process is, where some part of it is building, I imagine there was yeah. parts that were just more challenging to build, because, but anything that stood out? Oh gosh. Um, so there is, there is one piece where, and, and it's silly. It's like, I, I look back on some of it and in retrospect, I ended up cropping most of this <laughs> detail out. But I was like, I want to have this like, sh- you know, shiny water area um, for a, a lake scene that I did. 
And so I used a bunch of resin and it was dripping down as I was, you know, like it kept leaking from the bottom of, of the little barrier that I tried to build up. And it ended up being very unnecessary, (laughs) but you know, these are all learning experiences. So (laughs) no, it's funny, but it's also part of like the whole picture that you're trying to build right like back to being yeah. authentic like sometimes you have to build more than what you end up showing because it rounds out what the thing even is you know right right and i mean you know you learn as you go it's like well i didn't really need to build that element i probably could have just figured that out <laughs> right. but you don't know, you know it's i guess it's better to do that sometimes than get frustrated and spend way too long on a certain section and you know yeah not have it go the way you want it to go (laughs) better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it (laughs) exactly exactly um so let's talk about what you have coming up what's been your main focus lately since that show and and what's the rest of 2024 look like for you so i mean i've very much been easing into this year after the show um i have one piece that i just finished up uh that's going to be going to Arch Enemy um, for their, I believe it's their 12th year anniversary show, uh, which is going to be taking place April 5th. So yeah, there's that. I've been, I don't have a ton um, scheduled at the moment, but I've been really updating my website lately. And um, I have a new print shop that I am... um, in the works of finishing. So, you know, I always have a lot of people asking, you know, for prints and the availability of that. So I want to make that available to whoever, whoever wants one. So I, by the time this is out, I should have that up and ready to go. So I'll share that just in my social media. Awesome. And, um, any, do you have any idea, uh, in general, like how, far out you want your next show to be or like any plans around that? Uh, honestly, I feel like I could take on something else here soon, but regardless, if I, even if I don't have something in the books, I'm always creating new pieces. I'm always just working ahead because I know eventually it'll find a home. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would rather have an arsenal of work, you know, than get, approached you know for something and be like oh shit i got this <laughs> right. long to throw this this amount of new work together yeah. like so yeah i'm always working awesome Any, anything else coming up that you'd want to put on people's radars i mean do you have like a, a timeline for when your prints will start um i mean you said the new shop will come out will you have new prints as part of that like launch so a lot of them are going to be from my last show but I'm going to try to make quite a few of them available. So and some of them are up right now and ready to go. Um, if anyone is interested, um, and I'm going to continue to add to it, but it's just at mollygrunninger.com. Awesome. And that was going to be my next question is where can people find you online? But you just answered that. So <laughs> That's it. It's just, it's literally just my name. <laughs> awesome. So last question, and this is something that I like to ask everybody. Who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Oh, okay. Um, so I don't, I don't know. You may have had her on the show. I'm not sure. Um, Soy Milk. Oh, nice. I, I don't know. If, no, I haven't. Yeah. I love her work. I mean, she is someone who there, there are a lot of beautiful translucent layers and they're very expressive and figurative and, um, yeah, I adore her work. So. Yeah, great combination of like expressive and figurative. I mean, the, the way that you said that, um, uh, that definitely speaks to me. Um, so yeah, the great suggestion. I, I really appreciate it. And Molly, thank you so much for coming on the show and chatting with me. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, this was great. Thank you. I, I appreciate you having me. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Molly. I thought it was super interesting to learn more about the story that Molly's been telling through her work. How the story isn't so much about the person or the figure, but 
more about the way that person is expressing their own identity through their adornments, literally communicating who and what they are through these decorative elements. To draw parallels between that idea and how beautiful birds put on a show in nature to create this sort of social facade to the outside world really helped to connect it for me. And, you know, trust me, I have watched endless Sir David Attenborough (laughs) nature documentaries, and I absolutely love those birds. So that definitely resonated with me. And then in her most recent body of work, to evolve that idea even further, to talk about the sort of bi-directional impact that we in nature have on each other, and some of the existential dread that's been in the air lately around this crisis that we're, quite frankly, hurtling ourselves into. It's super interesting to look at it through that lens. Be sure to keep an eye out for the new piece that Molly has in the upcoming anniversary show at Arch Enemy Arts in Philly. They're celebrating 12 years. So congrats to them on that. Uh, Sounds like that show will be opening on April 5th, the Saturday after this episode should debut. Also, by the time this show debuts, she should have already launched her new print shop and some of her recent pieces available in print form. Definitely check that out and follow her Instagram to keep up with what she does next. So thanks again to Molly for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artifairs. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artifairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artifairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Thank you.